Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. In this lesson, we'll explore the elusive element of risk. That is, it's always there, but not always apparent to us. We'll talk about how risk is the fundamental element that we're trying to account for when we use statistics. Now, there's just one prerequisite lesson to this lesson, and that's the prior lesson that talks about problem resolution using Demaic, where I describe a medical situation with my daughter Hannah. But for now, we'll begin this lesson by evaluating risk versus reward. Well, I believe in many ways risk affects every single decision that we make. For example, if you have a car and you're trying to drive your car, but you knew that there was a high risk that the car would break down, then would you make the decision to actually drive it? Well, depending on the situation, if it's something that was urgent where you had to get to the emergency room at a hospital, maybe it's a risk worth taking. But if you knew there was a high risk that it was going to break down for some long vacation or trip that you're going to take, well, then it may not be something that you'd want to decide to do. Maybe there's some other decision you want to make in order to avoid that risk. Or, for example, if you were deciding you wanted to go to a restaurant and you knew that there was a high risk of food poisoning there, even if it's your favorite restaurant, well, again, you may not be so willing to go there if you knew that risk existed. But we're making some assumptions here that those risks are really low if we don't know about it. Or if you had seen the prior video where I talked about my daughter Hannah where she had arthritis as a symptom of actually strep throat, which was the root cause. Well, in that particular situation, we were actually taking some risks that the antibiotics were safe enough for my daughter to take and that the, the any risks associated with the antibiotics were far less uh, compared to the pain that she was feeling. Well, that very often can happen with other situations, medical situations that is, where sometimes the side effects for the medication can sometimes be very worse than the original symptoms in the first place. So again, sometimes there are risks involved in every single decision we make, albeit that some of those risks can be very small. So I believe, though, that prudent business decisions should at least account for and understand and measure the risk that's involved in those decisions. So let me give an example of like a glass of water. We might say that the entire glass of water would represent all the available understanding, all the information that might be available to us in order to make a, a decision about something in particular. Well, in that example, we might say the air that where the water is not filled up in the glass, that empty portion where the air is might represent assumptions or risk. Whereas the water portion, the part that's filled, might represent the data or the level of confidence we have for the decision because we have some information filled up within that glass. Well, just as adding water to the glass is going to displace the air, in the same way when we add data, relevant information, well, that will displace our assumptions. And by displacing that, it will also help mitigate those risks that might be behind those assumptions. So risk has an inverse relationship with confidence in that way. That is, if the more data that we collect, data like in terms of the proof or evidence or information we're collecting about a particular situation, the more we have, well, that will build our confidence. By building our confidence, then it's going to help reduce the risk. But when we don't have data, when we don't have enough information behind the situation that we're trying to make a decision on, well, then all we're filling up with then is assumptions. And those assumptions are what create the risk in our decisions. So in order to reduce the risk and build confidence, we need to get data. Not just any data, but hopefully the relevant data for our situation. Nearly all the statistical tests that we run are going to measure risk to some level or another. And typically that risk, the way the tests run, are measured by what's called a p-value. So that's what we're going to look for when we run statistical tests. We look for the p-value, which is a measurement of risk. So let's talk about what is the overall goal of statistics. So before we go too deep in talking about statistical tests and how those are run, let's talk about some of the overall concepts behind statistics, where the overall goal is that we're trying to use some sample to make an inference about a population. Now let me give you a more practical example of where this might apply. Let's say we have a huge jar of jelly beans, and our goal is we want to count the number of red jelly beans that there are in the jar. Well, there are two ways that we might be able to get an answer for that question. First method we might follow is to empty out all the jelly beans from the jar and we manually pull out all the red ones and start to count them one by one. Well, if we follow this method, it'd be very effective. The advantage or the pro for that method is that we'd be much more accurate in our answer. But the disadvantage or the con is it would take a whole lot more time if we did that. 
where another method that we could follow also is that we actually just take out a small portion of the jelly beans from the jar, count the red ones within the small portion, and then we multiply that answer out to the proportional volume, overall volume, that's in the jar. Well, if we did that, the advantage of is that method is going to take a lot less time because we're not manually organizing all the jelly beans to pull out all the red ones and count them one by one. So it's going to be a whole lot faster that we can get to an answer. But the disadvantage of that side, or the con for that, that method, is that it will be a whole lot less accurate in comparison. So it looks like on the surface, method two is what's used in the concept of statistics, where there's a small portion or some sample that is going to be collected in order to make an estimate or some inference across an entire group or the whole population. That is, we're taking a small sample from the large jar of jelly beans to make an inference or estimate of what those red jelly beans are across that entire jar of jelly beans. But does that mean that method two is necessarily better? Most people would naturally think that method two is better, but is it? It may be better, but it really depends on risk. So is method two actually better? Well, again, it really depends on risk. So in order to understand risk, we need to evaluate the cons, that is the disadvantages that we identified for each of those methods for counting the jelly beans. Each of those disadvantages or the cons represent the amount of risk that we have within those methods. So for example, the first method, we were counting them out one by one that disadvantage was that there was going to be a lot more time involved. So the question we might want to ask is how much more time will it take to manually count the red jelly beans? Whereas for the second method where the disadvantage was that it was going to be a lot less accurate, well then we might ask how accurate do I have to be in my estimate of those red jelly beans? So what we want to do is we want to compare the risks and the rewards within those two methods. So from the risk perspective, we're basically looking at time versus accuracy. Again, the issues were related to how much more time it was going to take versus how, how, how more accurate do I have to be in my answer. So the difference here is between time versus accuracy, and we want to ask, well, which is more important in those situations? Well, in order to do that, we need to figure out what's the reward for each of those methods. Let's say that the prize for getting the right number of answers was going to be a t-shirt. Well, we might be more inclined to follow the second method instead, something that takes a whole lot less time, because we don't want to invest a whole lot of time when the reward is small. But what if it's 100 US dollars? Well, then, depending on the size of the jar and how much time will be involved, it might be a toss-up between whether we're going to follow that second method or whether we're going to follow the first method of counting them out one by one. But what if the prize was a million US dollars? Well, for the most part, a lot of people are probably going to opt for method one, where we're going to pour those jelly beans out, count them all one by one, and even if it takes us several years to count all of those, the million dollar reward would definitely be worth it. Now, if you notice, within both of those situations, the, the methods never changed. The time that's going to be involved with either method was not going to change. The disadvantages or the risks involved were not going to change. The only thing that changed was the reward. So when we account for at least the reward and understand how that balances with risk, it could affect our decision of which method we're going to use. So what we also need to consider are the constraints that could be involved. It may not be as straightforward as just having access to the jar in order to spill out the jelly beans and count them one by one for a million dollar prize. For example, what if we were only given one minute in order to answer the question? Well, we might have no choice but to use the second method simply because we need something that's going to offer us a lot less time in our answer. Or what if the jar was actually 10 feet tall, something that was huge? Well, again, for $100, it may not be worth it to pour out the jelly beans and count them. For a million dollars, I'll bet a lot of people would still be willing to do it because the reward is so good. Now, also another constraint could be, what if we weren't given access to the entire jar? In other words, we weren't able to actually apply method one. Well, then we might have no choice but to use some sort of uh, optimal method of method two. That is, we might be able to visually take some sort of sample and make some other estimates. But again, neither of those methods may be able to, to be possible in a situation like that. So we have to understand these constraints. So how does Six Sigma actually deal with the different risks and rewards and constraints that are involved? Well, I believe that by understanding the voice of the customer or the VOC gives us an understanding of how we can understand those constraints that are involved in the situation that we're trying to evaluate and gives us a better understanding of all the risks and rewards that are involved and how to balance those and account for them. Well, statistical tools that we use later on, like in the analyze phase, are designed to analyze the data and evaluate those levels of risk. 
Now, the goal, I believe, is not that we're trying to completely eliminate or mitigate the risk, but I believe the actual goal that we want to answer is how can I minimize the risk and maximize the rewards within my given constraints? I believe that is the primary question that we're trying to answer by doing statistical analysis. But what if you don't have access to the population data? It's so rare in life to have an opportunity to analyze a population. That's so true that it's very rare in life for us to even have that opportunity to analyze a whole population. But measuring data across the population, though it might be ideal, it may not always be most practical for us. So that's where we have to rely on statistical tests, like we do for elections or market analysis or employee performance or customer satisfaction, those kinds of things that help us to understand basically what the sample is and how we can make inferences off of that sample for the entire population. So prudent data analysis really helps require that we understand the assumptions that we're trying to make. For example, in our jelly beans example that we're using, we're assuming that the sample of jelly beans represents the population, but what if our sample only had 10 jelly beans? Is 10 jelly beans enough of a sample size to make an inference on the population? Or how big should our sample size be to ensure that we have a good representation of the population? And how do we know that our method for collecting the sample is actually correct and random in the method? And we also assume that we know the volume of the jar. Well, what if we're completely wrong in how big the volume is? Again, because from our sample, a number of red jelly beans we might collect in our hand, we're using that to factor out according to the proportional volume of that entire jar of jelly beans. But what if we're wrong in that assumption of what the volume is? We also assume that the jelly beans are evenly mixed, that is, they're very random in the color distribution within the jar. But what if the actual jelly beans look like this example of the jar here, where they're layered? Well, we could take a scoop from the top, and we can take at least half the jar out, or three quarters of a sample of the jar out, and we still would never encounter any red jelly beans. So we might come to the conclusion, there are no red jelly beans in the jar, and we'd actually be very wrong, because maybe we're making an assumption of that distribution, the random distribution of the jelly beans within the jar. Now what's the risk if we don't consider these kinds of assumptions ahead of time before we're actually collecting our sample? We actually may be making wrong conclusions that could eventually lead us to making the wrong actions. So assumptions are a very primary form of risk for us. So we need to at least validate our assumptions and test them in some way and reduce the risk and increase our confidence the more we can understand and measure our assumptions. Assumptions aren't necessarily bad, but it's very important for us to understand that they do represent a primary form of risk. And the more that we can validate our assumptions, such as using data and statistical analysis, we're in effect reducing our risk and increasing our confidence in the decisions that we make. So, now before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. I'd like to explore how assumptions can affect our decisions. So, like, have you ever said the phrase to yourself, if I only knew then what I know now? Well, usually when we use a phrase like that, we're referring to a situation where we, where we might have made a wrong or uninformed decision. So let's think of at least two situations like that in the past, either from a personal perspective or maybe at work, wherever. But think of at least two situations where we know we might have made a critical error in, in a wrong action or some uninformed decision that we made. And for those situations, try to answer some of these questions. First of all, what's the critical information that would have helped you to make a difference or maybe a better decision in that particular situation? And how could you have acquired that critical information in that particular situation, if it was possible at all? And if you were in that similar situation today, having the same limited knowledge that maybe you had then, what would you do differently in your decision process? Would you do anything differently at all? Because if you wouldn't, then why not? Why wouldn't you have done anything differently? Or if you would have done something differently, then what is different about your decision process now compared to that situation before? Then based on the answers that you've given in that situation, what does that really reveal about how you balance your risk versus reward in your decision process? For example, are you maybe more prone to making quick or risky decisions? Or are you something who's very risk averse, where you're very careful and meticulous before you make a decision, you need to understand all the possible risk involved? How does that affect you as far as your decision process? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.